Good evening. My name is Rebecca, and I'm so excited to be telling you a really cool story tonight. Um, it was hard to fit it into 10 minutes, but I will do my best. On December 5th, 1879, a 230-ton shaft of granite was suspended at 12 degrees from vertical on the shores of Alexandria. Americans have been known to make bold international statements from time to time, and this one held no fewer consequences in the balance. Henry Honeychurch Gorringe, Lieutenant, how do I make this scroll down? Lieutenant Commander in the U.S. Navy. <laughs> Sorry, hold on just a second. <laughs> How do I scroll with the slide? Okay. You gotta be there. Gotta yeah. be there. Two fingers. Gotcha. Two fingers. Thank you. Two fingers. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Um, Lieutenant Commander, U.S. Navy. Okay, I'm, I, I have to say the name again. Henry Honeychurch Gorringe. He was tired of the European community giving him shit about the soundness of his engineering. At approximately 67 feet long and over 8 feet square at the base, the 3,000-year-old obelisk hanging in the balance was a priceless Egyptian artifact. But it was also young America's chance to stand next to Britain and France in the big boys club of colonialist collection of cool stuff from exotic places. <laughs> Gorringe left the obelisk tilted overnight to make the point. But when it was near horizontal the next day, a cable snapped and the stone began a terrifying free fall past 90 degrees. Crowds screamed and scattered, but after a cringy bounce on a, pile, on a wood pile, Gorringe knew his pride would remain intact. Phase one complete. Now that the scary part was out of the way, Gorringe began lowering the stone with hydraulic jacks, mountains of imported timber, and an army of men four inches at a time. <clears throat> As the obelisk pedestal was deconstructed, Gorringe found what looked like intentional evidence of ancient Freemasonry. Two of the granite blocks were polished and the third was rough. One of the granite blocks was a perfect cube, and on the limestone block next to it was a metal trowel and a lead plumb bob. They also found an engraving of two snakes symbolizing wisdom. Being a Freemason himself, he determined to bring the 50-ton pedestal to New York, which was not part of the original plan. His brothers must have a chance to appreciate this find. After dressing the needle with a protective case of wood, Divers began clearing a path through what was assumed to be a giant submerged blocks of Cleopatra's palace. Unlike the English, who had used dynamite to address this problem, he had each enormous block removed and set aside on shore. The heavy caisson was towed to port to await loading. Oh, wait for it. Maps. Now, it's impossible to appreciate the sheer magnitude of the adventure he was undertaking without making some notes of how it was done in the past. The obelisk in question, one of a pair commonly known as Cleopatra's needles, had been created in 1470 BC to tout the victories of Tutmosis III. It was moved in 12 BC with its mate from Heliopolis, now Cairo, um, to Alexandria to grace a Caesarium in honor of Augustus. Cleopatra had suggested the move, but by no means claimed the needles. There's not much documentation on how the Romans achieved the transplant, but we know much more about how the English and French did it in the 19th century. While Britain had been offered an obelisk as early as 1811, when they ousted the French, they had been unwilling to spend the money to move it. Everyone already knew they had won the war, and frankly, they hadn't seen one that was worthy of the effort. This is the Alexandria obelisks. The second one, the one laying down, actually, was the one the English took. <clears throat> Napoleon had lost the war for Egypt, but he was still fascinated by the antiquities there, especially the marks of the pharaohs. It took them nearly seven years of battling environmental, social, and engineering challenges, but Apollinaire Lebas meticulously planned the journey from Luxor. I'm going to go back really quick just so you see... Oh, shit. Uh, the, I don't know if you noticed Luxor at the bottom of the map, but 
but that's a lot of Nile to cover. That's the, the third star down. Okay. His Egyptian workers removed tons of rubbish, cut through two villages, removed 30 huts, and graded one quarter mile path to the Nile. Their specially built ship, the Luxor, was run aground uh, to enable loading, but ended up buried under a protective layer of sand and reeds in order to prevent summer damage to the wood while they waited for the high Nile. Um, amidst cholera outbreak and uh, other environmental challenges, the Luxor was eventually launched uh, with the High Nile, and they found uh, in Alexandria that it was very unwieldy because it was specially built to carry the obelisk, so it was uh, very long, it was narrow enough to fit under the bridges in Paris, and uh, wide enough, shallow enough to float the narrow Nile and Seine. <clears throat> it was towed across the Mediterranean, and in 1836, the Luxor Obelisk was proudly erected in the Pla Place de la Concorde on top of an ornate pedestal with gold-plated images of the engineering tools used. Napoleon finally displayed the measure he'd been claiming. By now, the English couldn't stand the fact that France had erected their war trophy before they did. 59 years after the original offer, they would finally do the work and spend the money to move their own obelisk. John Dixon, chief engineer, built a metal frame and tube around their stone, which was already horizontal. When they rolled the tube, named Cleopatra, into the water, it stopped just a few feet in. Naturally, they pushed and pulled harder and harder until Dixon decided to check for flooding. Sure enough, Cleopatra had been punctured by a submerged rock. Bring out the dynamite. Several days and explosions later, Cleopatra, with cabin and mast attached, just in case, was towed out of Alexandria by the Olga across the Mediterranean. <laughs> <laughs> Using very rudimentary communication techniques. Everything was fine until an unrelenting hurricane forced the crew aboard Cleopatra to evacuate. The Olga lost six crew members, and uh, the Cleopatra was actually lost to sea because they had to uh, detach from each other. A Spanish ship uh, found, <laughs> found the Cleopatra, knew exactly what it was all about, and demanded 80,000 pounds salvage fee. <clears throat> the final settlement, settlement was only 2,500 pounds to be split among the captain and the crew, uh, but it eventually made, down, made its way down the River Thames and was mounted at the Adelphi Steps, safe from conservative Victorian eyes. <laughs> Getting back to our American extraction effort, Gorringe took inspiration from uh, an engineer in 1768 who moved the 600-ton um, pedestal for Alexander, or, uh, sorry, um, Peter the Great's. Uh, a monumental statue in St. Petersburg. Um, he had used metal rails and balls to conquer gravity and friction. After a precarious loading of the 50-ton pedestal into the hold, Gorringe used cannonballs in his me metal rails to insert his package into the opened hole of the steamer de Sug <laughs> at a carefully calculated 22 degrees. The <laughs> you guys make this hard. The, ca <laughs> the cavity uh, was, re <laughs> was reconstructed for departure and open again in New York. <clears throat> Legal complications prevented him from registering the Desug to the United States. So he had faced opposition from the Europeans. He had faced deserting crew members. Uh, going out to sea without a registration meant that anybody could board his boat and take it board his ship and take the entire thing. He was ready to face pirates after all of the, uh, the <laughs> <clears throat> obstacles he had overcome. He overcame leaking boilers, a broken crankshaft, a 50-foot ship-killing water spout, which didn't actually kill the ship, and obelisk mania scalpers. New York was hysterical about receiving their Cleopatra's needle and um, 
women, Victoria, Victorian women wore lead phalluses around their necks for obelisk pencils, and uh, advertisers got away with horrible, horrible images. Gorringe also had to briefly contemplate docking in Baltimore or Philadelphia, much to his dismay, uh, because the owner of the only suitable dry dock in New York was charging an astronomical fee. The Freemasons were really proud of their heritage that they felt was traveling across the, the ocean. They, 8,500 of them assembled, marched in military ranks to Central Park to install the pedestal, um, only to be told by Grandmaster Jesse B. Anthony that their organization actually wasn't that old. <laughs> the progression of the obelisk uh, happened across Central Park in December. So Gorringe and his hand-picked crew worked day and night through multiple blizzards and debilitating cold. The team built a trestle from Fifth Avenue in to uh, get the obelisk to the, the center of gravity to the correct position above the pedestal. There, the turning mechanism Gorringe had designed for Alexandria was reassembled and waiting for the final erection. After only 15 minutes, the needle was upright, but it wasn't until 8 p.m. that the obelisk stood secure, ready to face up to 78 tons of force on its center of gravity. There we are in Central Park. I'd like to say the story ends here with all of Egypt's desert babies living happily ever after in cold, damp climates. Uh, but I'm compelled to mention that in 2011, Mayor Bloomberg of New York received a scathing letter from Egypt uh, from the Supreme Council of Antiquities. Why were shrubberies and soot obscuring the engravings? Why had New York forgotten her treasure? If she didn't want it, please send it back. True, the acid rain and freezing temperatures haven't done the ancient red granite any favors, but research showed it was also compounding centuries-old damage by Persian fires. Lasers were used to clean the stone, repairs were made, and the shrubberies were trimmed. Arguably, Egypt has had a hard time preserving the antiquities that remain in the country, but one can easily imagine why they have such an attachment to these three. In the 19th century, Egypt saw great development and crippling bankruptcy. Goodwill gifts like these fed the Egypt mania that swept Victorian Europe and United States. And unfortunately, much of the wonder of their creation was lost in the, on the manic populace. The engineering feats accomplished in their journeys abroad are monumental indeed, slightly overshadowed, in my opinion, by the fact that they were quarried, carved, moved, and erected by hand 3,500 years ago. Raise your glasses with me to celebrate these monumental monoliths, these superior spires, these fantastic phalluses. May we continue to tell their stories and strive to protect the human excellence they represent. <laughs>